I've come to the Wright Brothers National Memorial to learn about the flight of the Wright Brothers and how they invented the airplane. So let's go inside and see what we can find. This museum does a great job of explaining how the Wright Brothers became interested in flight, the things they did to develop their first flying machine, how they used gliders and other things to develop their theories. It was a fascinating trip through time. Now, in the next room, they have a display that chronicles each year that the Wright brothers came to the Outer Banks. And the replica of the Wright flyer that they used the first time is amazing to look at. Just to see how the engine fit into all the mechanics on the airplane, I was fascinated by it. And I walked around this thing for quite a while, examining every detail including the propellers that look so close to the way that modern propellers look, and looked at the front stabilizer and the rear rudder as how they control the right flyer. They have reconstructed the camp of the Wright brothers when they were learning to fly. They've got the living quarters where they worked and the hangar where they kept their aircraft. It's just really interesting to see how they lived while they were here. One thing that I recommend doing while you're here is walking the flight path of the first flight. The stone behind me is approximately where they took off and they've measured the distances out for each flight and marked them. So when you walk it, you just get an idea of how short that first flight really was. I've come to the back of the monument that they've set up for the Wright brothers on the hill. And there I found bronze statues of the first flight. I really like how they captured the moment, how they have everybody in the position that they would have been in when they took that famous picture of the first flight. Now this thing looks incredibly real. It really captures the moment of the first flight. Now one thing I highly recommend when you come to the Wright Brothers National Memorial is that you go to some of the ranger talks. These things are amazing. The rangers just really know their stuff and you'll learn so much more than just reading the signs. Just like everybody else, Wilbur and Orville are, are riding their bicycles and Orville actually started racing bicycles. But what do you think they did when their bicycles broke down? They fixed them, absolutely. They had the tools, they have the know-how, so they're gonna fix these bikes. They got very good at fixing bicycles. So good, in fact, that they actually opened up a bicycle shop where they sold and repaired bicycles. They had been following Otto Lilienthal for quite some time in the news. He was a German experimenter in gliding, breaking all sorts of world records. He was top in the field of aeronautics. So he starts studying birds, reading about birds, everything that he can, gathering up all this information about aeronautics. And as his little brother Orville recovers, he has this new dream. He wants to carry on Lillian Falls' work, and he thinks that they can do this, not just gliding, but powered flight. So finances, thankfully, Wilbur Norville's bicycle shop was pretty productive, and they actually were able to secure their own financing. They paid for all of their own experiments that they would do. But just like us, when they start off, they're gonna do some research. Maybe, you know, drawing out models. And they realize that the one thing that really hasn't been solved yet is control. That's how Lilienthal died. He lost control. That's how several other accidents that happen is lack of control. So as they're watching birds, they notice that birds sort of twist their wings. And that's how they control their flight. And they have the same idea to use that same basic principle with a kite. So they build a little biplane kite there in Dayton, a little five foot kite. And they have strings and they're pulling on this kite and they're twisting the wings. They call it wing warping. And it works pretty well on this kite. And it is working. This wing warping thing is working, at least on the box kite. So they want to test it on their glider. But there's a problem. 
there's missing something very important in order to do gliding experiments in Dayton, Ohio. They need something. Wind. Now, I know that it's windy in Dayton. I used to live there. However, they don't get consistent wind. And that's what you need in order to do gliding experiments. And so, they write the Weather Bureau in 1899, <clears throat> excuse me, 1899, because they are looking for the windiest cities in the United States. They are willing to travel for their dream. This has become their dream now. So they're willing to travel for this. And they get this list back. And at the top of the list is a city you guys might be familiar with. They call it the Windy City. Chicago, yes, Chicago. Dayton, Ohio, Chicago, Illinois. Really not that far away, right? They just have the state of Indiana. Quick train ride across the state of Indiana and you're in Chicago. Well, there's another gentleman in Chicago named Octave Chanute. He's doing gliding experiments as well. Now, when he does his experiments, the press shows up. Now, he doesn't mind because he wants the whole world to uh, share in, in uh, gliding experiments and his knowledge. Well, over in Orville, they don't want the whole world to share in their knowledge, not just yet, because they might be onto something with this wind warping. And, um, and also, the press will make fun of you if you fail. And they don't want to. What if they do fail? They don't want to be on the front page news for failure either. So they look at that list and they eliminate any city with a possibility that press could show up. And it gets them all the way down to number six. This beautiful place right here, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Now they don't know anything about it other than it has one of the things they want, isolation. You can't get here except by boat. It's these little islands outside of North Carolina. But they need to find out if it's worth traveling to. And they have conditions that need to be met before they're gonna do that. So they write the guy that's running the weather station and they ask him, do you have 12 to 15 mile an hour consistent winds? so they can get their glider into that wind. Do you have hills to jump off of into that wind? And do you have soft sand to land in? Because this business is dangerous. <laughs> and they really don't want to risk their lives. And he writes it back and he says, well, yes, we have all of those things. But before he sends that letter off, he sends it to, to Kitty Hawk here to the postmaster, William Tate. Now, William Tate, uh, he says, hey, Bill, tell him about the area. And so, William Tate, he's the postmaster here, in this area of maybe 67 people. That's it. Can't get here except my boat. This was all sand. So I'm gonna tell you all about this area. <laughs> 1900, all sand. Barrier Island, it's still a barrier island, but it looks very different than it did in 1900. You can see the ocean flat. You can see for miles, because there was nothing that got in your way. And I'm not talking buildings, I'm talking trees, because there were no trees. There were no trees, no grass, all sand. That hill was 300 to 600 feet closer to us. There were two others. <laughs> yes, so our winds normally come from the north, that direction, and it blows the sand this way. So it blew the dunes, right? Because that's what Barrier Island does, keeps moving. So he tells them all about the area. And he says at the bottom though, the one most important thing he says, please come to Kitty Hawk. We will help you out with any of those experiments, whatever they are. And that's the thing that's gonna seal the deal for Wilbur Norval because they're not seeking outside funding for their experiments because they might be on to something with that wing warping. So they don't want anybody to know about it just yet. So any of the money that they're using for their exper experiments, coming from their own pocket. Coming from their own pocket, their bicycle business. So they can only travel to North Carolina for a couple months out of the year. And they're gonna travel to North Carolina when their bicycle business is the slowest. So what time of year do you figure that is? Winter, absolutely. Late fall, early winter. That's when they're going to come to North Carolina. And so that's what they do. They decide to come to North Carolina in the fall of 1900 to test their 1900 glider. One of the things that Orville was already planning on bringing with him was a canvas tent so that they had somewhere to live that year. And they're going to pitch their canvas tent right outside the village of Kitty Hawk, which is four miles north of where we're standing now. And you might be able to make out the little white speck on the horizon there. That is their tent. But what I want you to note more than anything is the lack of vegetation, All right? So just a couple of scraggly trees here and then a whole bunch of sand. In fact, Orville writes home and he says, but the sand, it is the greatest thing in Kitty Hawk and soon will be the only thing in Kitty Hawk. All right, so if you've ever camped at the beach, you might understand how they're feeling. Um, now they're gonna fly their glider that year almost entirely as a kite because it doesn't quite support their weight. And that has a lot to do with having to change the shape of the wing last minute. But it does okay as a kite. They're not too disappointed with it. So they get that 1900 glider up in the air. What they want to do is they want to test that wing warping, right? So they're up there and they're flying and it works. Oh my gosh. And they're controlling it by a hip cradle. So every time they move their hip, it actually twists the wings and it works. They're able to go left and right the way they want to go. Oh, uh -huh, we're on to something. We tried to glide using it. We only got maybe about 10 second glides and not very far. As brother showed us.
shows up in a couple of weeks and they hire an 11 year old and put him up on this thing and fly it like a kite controlling it with the wings. Isn't that a fun ride? Now, because they only come here a couple months out of the year, this is where they do all of their experiments. So this is where they're doing all of their data gathering, right? So they are gathering all kinds of measurements whenever they're flying. Lift and drag measurements. They're also taking pictures of all of their experiments and they're doing journal entries, diary entries, you name it. They're doing that because they need to gather as much information because when they go back home, that's when they're gonna do their improvements. So this is their experimentation site, all right? Not long before they're planning to leave anyway, on a day that they're not using the glider, it gets caught in a gust of wind and it crumples up into the carcass you see here. Uh, they left this carcass behind and Mrs. Tate, the postmaster's wife, used some of the fabric to make clothing for her daughters. So they go home, they're pretty excited. Woohoo, wing warping worked, worked. So now what they want to do is they want to improve their wings. They want to get better lift because they feel like they could get better lift better than what they had in 1900. And so they're going to change their 1901 version. Remember, changed it over the years, right? So 1901 glider, what they want to do is they want to get better lift, so they're going to change the wings. And they're going to use the data they gathered, but also the data that's out there. You're going to change the wing shape, the camber, and then they're going to make them a little bit wider because they feel like more surface area is going to give us more lift. So that's what they do. So they hire Charlie Taylor. Charlie Taylor is um, an excellent bicycle mechanic, and they hire him to run their bicycle shop. And they decide that they're gonna come here in July of 1901 to test that 1901 glider. They are camping for the first time right here where we're all sitting and standing four miles south of the village of Kitty Hawk. They're still living in their canvas tent, so you can imagine they are not doing a very good job of escaping those mosquitoes. They're pretty miserable. So in 1901, they have all the top engineering technology of the time. Surely this device is gonna be the first thing to really have controlled flight on the top of the hills. And it has all the great numbers of the time. They went up to the kill level, so this tall hill was a little taller, it was 105 feet high. And they got this brand new glider, they get up to the top and they jump off. Didn't even work as well as the one before. A little bigger, 22 feet wide. And Wilbur Wright's truly puzzled by it. He thinks this should be doing much better. It should be getting about two thirds more lift than he was getting before. It has to be something with the wings. So he's doing some testing and maybe tweaking, and he ends up breaking the American gliding record at about 300 feet glide. And on top of all that, their glider is not performing well. Uh, so this is what it looked like in 1901. It's sort of standing up on its tail. That's Orville standing next to it. And notice the shape of the wing is sort of short and stubby. So this glider is not getting nearly the lift that the calculations say it should be. And they're also having a really big control issue that they call well digging. So when they try to use their roll system, uh, their wing warping, what happens is that instead of a nice gentle turn, they get this really sharp, dramatic shift and then it spins on them. And that's really dangerous. Uh, it's certainly not how they envisioned it was gonna be working. And they're starting to get really discouraged. They actually pack up to go home early. Oh my gosh, they are so frustrated, so miserable, and so upset that on the train ride home, Wilbur looks at Orville and he says, you know what? Flight's gonna happen, but it's not gonna happen in our lifetime. They wanna quit. They wanna quit. They take that glider when they get home and they put it in the shed and they don't talk about flight. They go to Chicago. Well, I say they, but Wilbur's the only one that's gonna present the experiments because Orville, never in a million years would he get in front of a crowd. He is terrified of public speaking. So Wilbur goes and presents his, their experiments and he listens to what everybody has to say. And the most important thing he comes away with is that they know more than anybody in that room. Because remember, they have wing warping, right? They have wing warping, they have control. Everybody else, flinging their legs around, <laughs> right? They're all flinging their legs around and hoping. So they know they are years ahead of anybody else in this business, they know it. So that gives them renewed faith in their experiments. So they go back home. They're like, oh, well, we can't quit. We are years ahead of everybody. And so what they do is they have to come up with new data because the data they used didn't work. Whatever's out there didn't work. And so they need to come up with new data. And in order to do that, they make a wind tunnel. And they're gonna test wing shapes, airfoils, wing shapes, different curvatures of wings in this wind tunnel. Because what they're looking for is a wing that's gonna give them the greatest amount of lift and the least amount of drag. And it takes over 200 airfoils before they come up with a perfect wing shape. And they put that on their 1902 glider. A lot more narrow and a lot longer. They're pretty excited now. <laughs> they wanna really test this out. So they decide to come back here in 1902 they're gonna come back in the late fall again. <laughs> They've learned their lesson about that summertime. 
So this is a picture of Orl, uh, Orville piloting in 1902, their 1902 glider. This photo is actually labeled as Orville making a turn. So that is a really big deal. Uh, this is the first year that they add a rear rudder to their machine. And after some modifications, they are able to control all three dimensions uh, of control that we still use in flight today. Here's Wilbur piloting that same glider. What they learned from their wind tunnel studies was that the aspect ratio of the wing was off. So instead of short stubby wings, you need long slender wings to get good lift. They also learn about the, the camber or the, the curve of the wing that's going to give them better lift. They do a thousand successful glide flights off of that hill. A thousand. So let me tell you how impressive that is. That glider weighs 117 pounds. That hill, 90 feet high. <laughs> Remember, this is all sand. So carry a 117 pound glider up a 90 foot hill a thousand times. Now you know they were flying. They were flying and they were breaking every single one of the American gliding records. Every single one of them. They were. And every single time they're flying, they're becoming excellent pilots. They know how to handle this glider a thousand times. They know how to handle this glider. Frontwards, backwards, day or night, they know how to handle it. They have mastered the glider. What is next? What's the next move for them? Once they've mastered the glider, what are they going to do next? Power. power. Yes, power. Power. Because there is a contest for powered flight. And they want in on it. And so they need, they have the structure. They have the, they have the structure. So all they need is power. They need an engine and a propeller. That's it. Now the engine only has to be four cylinder, eight horsepower. That's it. But it has to be lightweight. Because in the glider, Wilbur and Orville are the center of gravity. Now they're gonna have to share that space with an engine. Wilbur and Orville are 140 pounds a piece. So the engine has to be lightweight, has to be. It cannot be more than 175 pounds because if it's any heavier, whatever side the engine's on, that wing will never come out of the sand. And so that's where their bicycle mechanic, Charlie Taylor comes in. <laughs> Charlie Taylor isn't just an excellent bicycle mechanic, he's an excellent machinist. And so he machines this engine of theirs out of aluminum, that lightweight metal. Oh, and it works. It works so well that it is not eight horsepower, it is 12 horsepower. They're so excited. Now they have a powerful engine. They just need a propeller now. That's it, that's all they need. Well, the unfortunate thing is there is absolutely nothing flying in the sky with a propeller. <laughs> and they're in their bicycle shop and they're over by the wind tunnel and they're looking at these wing shapes. And this idea comes to them. If we, if a wing can give us lift, if we turn it on its side, it can give us thrust. And that's what they do. They take a wing shape, they twist it and they tweak it, turn it into a propeller, and they test this propeller out. And it tests out at 82% efficient. It's within 5% efficiency of modern propellers. And that's why when you go in and look at our replica over here in the museum, you can look at those propellers and immediately recognize them as propellers because they are so similar to what we use today on modern aircraft. So they have their engine, they have their propellers, they also have to prepare the wing fabric, they pre-sew it on their sister sewing machine at home. Uh, they have to make all of the little bits and pieces that are going to attach it together because you can't just go down to the hardware store and buy airplane parts in 1903. So once they have everything all prepared, they come down here, they arrive in late September and they find their smaller building, which was the only one that they had left behind. It's moved several feet closer to the ocean in their absence because of storms. And that's where they were planning on living in 1903. So they're gonna to have to do repairs to that building before they have some place to live. They're also gonna to have to construct the entire second building, which is gonna be where they build and store their powered machine. And that takes a few weeks. So it's not until after all that construction that Wilbur sent that very optimistic sounding letter. So they're still feeling really good, even with those setbacks. It takes them a couple more weeks to build the machine. So by mid-October, they're ready to start doing stationary engine tests. And when they start doing these stationary engine tests, they learn that the engine vibrates so violently that it is damaging the propeller shafts, which they made out of hollow bicycle tubing because it was lightweight and they had a bunch of it lying around their bicycle shop. A friend of theirs is visiting when they learn this and he says, oh, it's okay, I'll take them to Norfolk with me when I leave and I'll ship them on to Dayton for you. Charlie gets them, he sends them back new ones made out of a sturdier hollow tubing. And when installed on the machine, they have the exact same problem. So Orville takes those propeller shafts all the way back to Dayton. He and Charlie work on the problem until they've come up with a solution. He, he returns with propeller shafts made out of solid spring steel. So these ones are finally going to be strong enough to withstand those engine vibrations. Uh, but it took them five weeks to figure all this out. So they've lost a lot of time. It's now early December. They promised their family they'll be home in time for Christmas, and it takes about four to five days to get home. 
So they only have a couple of weeks there in the middle of the December to make something happen that season. They have another problem on top of the short time frame. Uh, they need very specific wind speeds for their machine to get off the ground. They've already calculated they need 15 to 20 mile an hour winds, and they're just not getting it. So on December 14th, they decide they're going to make an attempt anyway, even though the wind is only blowing five miles an hour. To compensate for the lack of wind, they take their, their runway, if that's what you want to think of this rail as, as a runway. They take that runway, they put it at the base of Big Kill Devil Hill, and that's what you see in this photo here from December 14th, 1903, is their rail set up on the very base of the hill, not at the top, it's not real steep, just a gentle slope, and the flyer sitting at the back of the rail. They decided to get this thing off the ground by building a trackway. And on the trackway, if you ever take a chip over there, they put this dolly there that had caster wheels so that the flyer would take off and would leave the dolly behind. It seemed to be a good solution of getting it off the sand. If it was on wheels, it would take a lot more space. They thought the track was a better way to do it. And they flip a coin. Wilbur's going to be the first person to fly because he wins the coin toss. Well, he gets in the hip cradle, and as you hit in the hip cradle, you pull a wire, and it would allow fuel to fall into the engine, and it would start to move. He had been dreaming about this for years, you can imagine, right? He's going to be the man to take off the first power flight, keeping it balanced and controlled. He pulls up a little hastily, though, and his tail snatches the ground, it spins off to the side, lands very hard in the front, and he breaks the elevator on the first attempt. They do not consider this to be a successful flight. It's going to require repairs before they can make another attempt, and they also get bad weather for a couple of days, so they are stuck inside. And as they sit in there doing their repairs, it's sort of like when your mom sends you to your room and tells you to go think about what you've done. Uh, they have nothing better to do but to agonize over that decision, and they realize they may not get another attempt. If they do, they know it needs to happen from level ground because that's what's going to prove that their machine can take off of its own power. So on December 17th, when they're ready to try again, they wake up to winds blowing 23 to 27 miles an hour, so a lot higher than they want now. It's 30 degrees outside with a zero degree wind chill. Uh, <laughs> it's very cold. Uh, they uh, wait a few hours to see if the wind's going to die down, and when it doesn't, they hang a big sheet on the back of their building there, and that's a signal to the guys up at the life-saving station. They can see it with their spotting scope, and it means we're ready to do some experimenting. If anybody's available, come on down to help. Five men walk four miles in zero-degree wind chill that day to help them experiment. Three of them work at the life-saving station. One of them is a 16-year-old boy who shows up without any shoes on. And the fifth guy just happened to be passing through Kitty Hawk on business. He's actually from Manio over on Roanoke Island. So those five men help them get their uh, runway, their rail, set where our replica sits today. The machine would have been right there at the back of the rail, so they only gave themselves a 60-foot runway. That's how long our replica is today. And they know that it's going to be Orville's turn to fly because Wilbur got to go first. Okay, so they start up the engine, and the witnesses here that day say that the two brothers exchanged words and shook hands. Now they can't hear what they say to one another over the roar of the engine, but they say that they shake hands as two men who may never meet again. So it is a very somber moment as Orville climbs onto the wing of the flyer, and there's a small cable holding it still to the rail. When he's ready, he releases that cable, and the flyer starts to roll. And when it gets to the point where this boulder has been placed, he lifts into the air. And one of those guys ends up becoming a rock star after this. You know that first flight photo? Everyone's seen it, right? We'd be nowhere without it, definitely not talking about it. John Daniels, a photographer, was rather muscular. They needed him to bring the glider up and down the hill those many years. He said he was so excited he almost forgot. Can you imagine what the universe would be like if you don't have that picture? Definitely wouldn't be talking about it, right? But we have the beautiful universe, right? Where you got this beautiful picture of him. He had pressed the ball and you have the flyer coming just off the ground, his older brother running alongside it. I love being in that universe, right? Well, as Wilbur goes into the hip cradle to get started, what do you think Orville told him? No, they have the right idea. Don't crash. Definitely don't crash, yeah. <laughs> won't make that mistake. Yeah, and they also said first, yeah, it's my turn, right? Remember they flipped the coin, now they get to switch. So just like in the photo, right, it seems like it's the older brother's idea, but he's leading his little brother off in the history. And so we'll get in the hip cradle, and you see Wilbur running alongside him, he's keeping the wing steady as it gets up enough speed, and he's letting it go, like teaching a small child how to ride a bicycle. Such a beautiful story, right? Orville gets going on this thing, and he won't make the same mistake his brother does. He pulls up into the stiff breeze, and the first flight had to seem like it was going backwards. It was about six miles an hour was that first flight. But all that engine power is able to harness using his hips to keep the level and steady. Because remember, the thing wants to flip over, and it's going up and down into the breeze, only about six to eight feet high. As if the wind tunnel ends up getting stronger later on, and in no time they're flying over Paris and flying over New York City. But this is just high enough to get a little nervous. I never think Wilbur Wright was never more happy than the events of first flight. 
He had given so much of his life to that period to this pursuit of excellence, a higher purpose. I think it was the thing that had him enthusiastically get up in the morning. And as this thing touched down the first time, they had achieved power flight. They took the front part off and the back part off to make it easier to carry in the breeze, and they set it up for maybe a couple more runs. The idea was to get this experiment done by Christmas, and they go back home to have Christmas dinner. Isn't that a nice story? Well, this time, Warbur gets in it. There's a big divot out of the sand in front of him. What do you guys think he thought of that divot? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. yeah, competition makes for the best successes, right? Well, he gets in the hip cradle, and he gets the thing started. He pulls the wire, and starts to pick up speed. He remembers what happened a couple days before. He won't make the same mistake twice. He pulls up this time, and he goes into the breeze, just like his brother does, up and down into the breeze. I'm sure with even enough time to look down, just to make sure, right? And he lands in front of his brother's part, this time at 175 feet keeping it level and steady for 12 seconds. Again, the thing wants to crash, it wants to flip over. They both achieved power flight. You probably remember how cold it was. They took off the back part, the front part, and they all ran inside to get warmed up to think about how the rest of the afternoon's gonna go. Imagine there's seven guys in the cold in front of a flying machine, possibly the least glamorous thing you can ever imagine. They set it up one more time, and I'm sure Orwell doesn't like both of those divots, and he's gonna beat his, father, his brother's mark. He need him beat the time, too. He's gonna keep it level and steady this time, 15 seconds, and goes at 200 feet. Now that fourth marker, though, if you look all the way out there, if you look way out there, you notice the trees all the way out there. There was no trees back then. I'm sure Wilbur Wright's mind, he probably imagined he could have gotten to the other side of the world with no problem. Well, he jumps into the breeze and something really special happens. And I always wondered, did the human genius have watched these guys crash and get back up for so many years, want to make sure that they had something really nice to write home about, right? He goes into it, up and down into the breeze, keeping it level and steady this time for 59 seconds at 852 feet. So in one morning, at 10.30, they started, and at about noon, they had a cheap power flight from the stones through for nearly a half mile. After the fourth flight, they have every intention of making more flights that day. They're carrying the machine back. They set it down to take a break. Nobody's on it. It gets picked up and tumbled several times. It cracks the engine crankcase, along with a lot of other damage. They don't have a spare engine, so they're done. These are, these are things they can't fix. They box it up. They ship it home. They get home in time to celebrate the holiday with their family. And it's not until after Christmas that they start to develop all the negatives from the photographs that they took while they were here. And they learn that they have a picture of the very first flight made on December 17th, 1903. I've come to the hill where the Wright brothers made a lot of their glider flights. I'm going to go to the top and take a look at the monument. The idea of aviation even before that had to be something maybe a little bit more intellectual. That one through knowledge can rise above the realm of beasts, or one could through love get up to God himself. But these guys made it a little bit more tangible, made it real for a lot of people. And we able to appease our curiosities much faster. Relationships that would have been measured in months can then be measured in hours. So how do you honor an achievement of this type? Through the 1920s there was plans of cordoning off a part of East North Carolina to celebrate this achievement. And they decided to go with an architectural design contest to give us the mind of it. The War Department came out here to grass up the hill to keep it from moving, and they went with the Alfred Eason floor design of a triangle that's sitting on top of five star base. The wings stretched out on the side, I believe, is uh, in memory of that vulture that was gnawing at the exposed flesh of Prometheus to punish him for his glorious death. And that is the fact it's a triangle because from their one achievement created tons of other achievements from their mission. And it sits on top of a five star base, which is like a military installation. It's the idea that the elements, the air, the fire, and the water, they're all in unison by equilibrium, ruled by providence, and it becomes the ultimate symbol of the human will. So you imagine the top being that of the Prometheus, uh, the uh, story of Hercules using inspiration, and perseverance along with inspiration is a sign of the human will. It's almost like you're going to screw the top off and be able to unlock the keys of Western civilization, all from the middle of nowhere here in the Outer Banks. Isn't that a fun way to imagine all this? Something very rare, not a lot of people get to have that honor, to have their name in stone. They'll be here for a long time after. And maybe there'll be other generations who can actually fulfill some of the missing pieces. Because you walk in the doors, it's beautifully sculpted doors that were done by Lee Lowry, who did the old Atlas figure in front of Rockefeller Center. And you go inside, and there's a Roman inscription of the events of First Flight in 1903, but an old poem on the other side. And it reads, the long toil of the brave wasn't quenched in darkness, nor was counting its cost that fretted away the zeal and enthusiasm of their hopes. Over the fruitful earth and across the sea passeth the light of noble deeds. Unfortunately, I couldn't flatter myself to tell you I know what that means. But definitely something to reflect upon for the future, right? Because imagine this two guys came all the way out here looking for wind and sand and maybe to have a good time and end up developing that which the human genius had ever achieved because it was the most simple and the most grand. I hope you've enjoyed my visit to the Wright Brothers National Memorial. 
Well, until next time, see ya.